Slings and Arrows is an amazing television show that ran from 2003 to 2006 on the movie network in Canada. It was eventually broadcast in the United States from 2005 to 2007 on the Sundance Channel. It ran for three seasons, six episodes each, with a total of 18 episodes overall. The show received critical acclaim and was nominated for over 50 awards during its time on the air. Despite the show being acclaimed by every outlet that witnessed it, I've yet to meet anyone who has actually watched the show, aside from people who I've shared it with. The only reason I discovered it is because I'm a huge fan of the kids in the hall, so much so that I wanted to seek out the individual work of all the members after I finished marathoning the show, live show, movie, and miniseries. While all of the members certainly have made their fair share of quality products independently of the troupe, Mark McKinney topped them all by co-creating Slings and Arrows. In fact, as much as I love the kids in the hall and would pick them as my personal favorite sketch comedy group, I might like Slings and Arrows even more. That's not a statement I make lightly. With new episodes of the kids in the hall over in production at Amazon, and even talks of a potential Slings and Arrows prequel, it feels like a great time to revisit one of Canada's most underrated masterpieces. Slings and Arrows originally came to fruition in the late 90s when Tekka Crosby, a production executive at CTV, pitched an idea for a comedy show inspired by the Stratford Theatre in Ontario. For those of you who don't know, the Stratford Theatre is an internationally revered theatre famous for its productions of Shakespeare plays since its inception in 1952. Since then, the theatre has taken on many other types of plays such as Greek tragedies and Broadway-styled musicals, and featured many big-name actors such as William Shatner, Christopher Plummer, and Alec Guinness, among many others. The producers at CTV felt the idea for the series had potential and recruited actress and playwright Susan Coyne to write the pilot. Coyne was well known for her contributions in the world of theatre already, being not only a veteran of the Stratford Festival itself, but also one of the co-founders of the Soul Pepper Theatre in Toronto. The pilot Coyne wrote, originally titled Over the Top, was initially conceived as a half-hour comedy series. Coyne had many ideas, but was unable to weave said ideas into a full series so CTV producer Niv Fitchman commissioned a writing partner for Coyne, who was much more familiar with producing content for television, Mark McKinney. Following this, Fitchman recruited one last co-writer for the project, actor and writer Bob Martin, who is best known as a co-creator of the musical The Drowsy Chaperone, which would later go on to win five Tony Awards after its debut on Broadway. With all three writers finally locked in on the project, the final shape of the show was finally coming together, changing from a half-hour comedy series to a full-hour comedy drama retitled Slings and Arrows. It should be noted that while the show is based off of real people and situations that the creators experienced while working in the theater, the fictional New Burbage Festival which the show revolves around is not specifically based off the Stratford Festival in its entirety. It's more of an amalgamation of all the different theaters and festivals which the creators and cast worked for. The creators of the show admit that it was a nightmare to get off the ground, and the budget for the first season was slashed significantly. Most of the show is filmed in one of three locations, the New Burbage Theatre, the bar, or Ellen's house. The low budget of the show is pretty fitting given how much of the show is based on financial issues of the theatre. Much of the writing feels self-autobiographical learning this. The show follows Jeffrey, a former actor in the New Burbage Festival who was admitted to an insane asylum after having a mental breakdown during a performance of Hamlet. Jeffrey is played by Paul Gross, who is probably best known for his starring role of Constable Brenton Fraser on the Canadian television series Due South. The concept of Jeffrey having a mental breakdown while performing Hamlet is actually based on a real-life situation where Daniel Day-Lewis was performing Hamlet on stage in London. Day-Lewis apparently left mid-performance of the play upon supposedly seeing the ghost of his own father. Anyway, seven years after his mental breakdown, Jeffrey runs an unsuccessful theatre company which is closing down due to financial issues. Jeffrey's previous director, Oliver, who is still a director at the New Burbage Festival, dies after being run over by a ham delivery truck, and Jeffrey is hired as Oliver's replacement. However, in an obvious nod to Hamlet's father, Oliver comes back from beyond the grave to haunt Jeffrey, giving him unsolicited advice on how to properly run the festival. Each season of Slings and Arrows follows the production of a Shakespeare play, with the first season following Hamlet, the second season following Macbeth, and the third season following King Lear. I'm no Shakespeare expert, but I am familiar with these plays in some capacity. Before revisiting Slings and Arrows, I decided to re-familiarize myself with them via Akira Kurosawa, who adapted Hamlet, Macbeth, and King Lear into The Bad Sleepwell, Throne of Blood, and Ran respectfully. This is a bit off topic, but I personally thought those were the best film adaptations of Shakespeare's work I've seen, if you could consider them as such. In the same sense, if you consider Slings and Arrows to be adaptations of Shakespeare's work, it's the best I've seen on television. 
I say that because not only is the show about the production of Shakespeare's plays, but the characters themselves follow Shakespearean characteristics which mirror which play they're performing. You'll see what I mean as we delve through the show, but for those who may be concerned, you don't need to be proficient in Shakespearean language in order to watch Slings and Arrows. The characters speak modernly. Jeffrey also takes the time at the festival to mend his relationship with his ex-girlfriend and co-star, Ellen. Ellen is played by Martha Burns, who is another co-founding member of the Soul Pepper Theatre Company along with Susan Coyne. Jeffrey and Ellen have great chemistry together, undoubtedly helped by the fact that Paul Gross and Martha Burns are married in reality. Gross admits that he and Burns agreed not to talk about the show outside of work, but ended up eventually doing that anyway. This is hilarious because the characters of Jeffrey and Ellen agree to the same thing eventually in the series. Other members of the cast include Stephen Womet as Oliver, who, despite being known in the theatre community, might be best known for his role as Beetlejuice on Beetlejuice the Animated Series. Co-creators Mark McKinney and Susan Coyne also star in the show as Richard and Anna, who ironically are the characters running the festival, mirroring their roles in reality as showrunners. Another cast member was a little-known actress at the time that you may have heard of called Rachel McAdams as Kate, who was among the primary cast in the first season before blowing up in Hollywood with Mean Girls. Actress and director Sarah Pauly also joins the cast in the third season. Most of the supporting cast, unsurprisingly, are prominent theatre actors in the Ontario area, with many of them being veterans of the Stratford Festival. As someone who grew up around a lot of theatre actors, it hits close to home as I can see the idiosyncrasies of the characters as being very authentic to the theatre crowd. Every episode of Slings and Arrows is directed by Peter Wellington. Wellington's directing can switch from being very laid-back and intense, depending on what the scene is calling for. A lot of the strength on the screen comes from the strength of the actors, which is very true to theatre. The camera is rarely stationary and flows with the movement of the characters. It emphasizes the emotion of the characters very well in a subtle but very engaging manner. Clearly the directing is done in a way to get the most out of the script in every scene, and having the same man directing every episode makes the show feel consistent in its top-notch quality. Other technical aspects of the show deserve a lot of praise too. The music in the show is great. It sounds like the type of orchestrated music you would hear from a theatre orchestra. There's also a ticking noise which plays in pretty much every episode whenever there's a really tense moment. The show is so dialogue heavy that whenever there's a moment of silence with the characters quietly reflecting on the events, you really feel the weight of those scenes. Now that I've given you a basic overview of the crew who worked on this show and the technical accomplishments, it's time to delve into the meat of the production and examine the characters and their journeys. All of the characters are incredibly flawed, dealing with internal and external conflicts, and make the audience feel a lot of pathos. There's also many Shakespearean themes in the story, as many of the characters experience falls from grace and take actions which have consequences not only for themselves, but everyone around them. Many of the characters seem to have problems separating work and their personal life. However, whenever they're outside of work, they often seem lost and without purpose. Even in death, Oliver feels a compulsion to help Jeffrey put on the best show they can. Their work in the theater defines them, for better or for worse, and the stage feels like their home. I don't think Slings and Arrows would have worked anywhere nearly as well if it wasn't written by people involved in theater productions. Let's start delving into the characters by talking about our protagonist, Jeffrey. A huge theme that this show tackles is mental illness, which many of the characters suffer from in one way or another, but it is best exemplified through Jeffrey's character. The show touches on this subject with a great deal of sensitivity. While we laugh at Jeffrey because of the dialogue and performance are so great, we also have no trouble feeling sorry for him for his suffering from his madness. Some of Paul Gross's best acting is when Jeffrey is extremely agitated. It's quite possible that Jeffrey could have ended up like Game Dude, madly ranting on the beach for hours about his past relationships. It goes without saying that sometimes, a lot of the people in life who are the best innovators and great artists are also the people who, from the outside, are the most problematic and possibly crazy. Jeffrey fits this description to a T, as he is clearly a brilliant man who makes great art, despite his personal issues. Jeffrey yelling at Oliver and being seen as either crazy or mistaken for yelling at someone else is a constant source of comedy throughout the show. For much of the first season, it is unclear as to whether Jeffrey is hallucinating Oliver, or if he is really appearing to Jeffrey. This works really well as Jeffrey's mental state is clearly not very sound, whether he is really seeing Oliver or not, so it keeps the audience guessing. Each season of Slings and Arrows represents a different stage of life, with the first season being youth, the second season being middle age, and the third season being elderly. Jeffrey follows the theme of youth in that much of the first season deals with him reflecting on the mistakes of his past, whereas the second and third seasons follow him dealing with his newfound success. Hence, going from finding yourself, the stage of youth, to finding stability in the life you chose, the stage of middle age. The first episode literally opens up with Jeffrey fixing a toilet. This is a great visual metaphor of his journey of fixing his life which has gone to shit. A character who may be even more flawed than Jeffrey is the man who is haunting him, Oliver. 
When we first see Oliver in the series, he is an aging, lonely, condescending alcoholic with little empathy for anyone he comes in contact with. Oliver has clearly fallen from grace and is possibly becoming senile. The first episode does a great job establishing his character in relationships, and then ends the episode by killing him with the ham delivery truck. I talked a lot in my Nobuhiko Obayashi video about the theme of people dying and not really leaving you, which is a constant theme throughout his films. This is also a big theme in Slings and Arrows, mostly through Oliver's character. Oliver appears usually when Jeffrey is at a low moment, giving further credence that this is all in Jeffrey's head. On the other hand, it also would make sense for Oliver to come back from beyond the grave to redeem himself for all the trauma he inflicted on the other characters, whether he likes it or not. Oliver literally haunts Jeffrey while the events of the New Burbage Festival in the past figuratively haunts him. Because of Oliver, Jeffrey feels like he's living in his own private purgatory. The show's third main character is Ellen, Jeffrey's on-again and off-again lover throughout the series. Apparently, Ellen was specifically written with Martha Burns in mind as the actress to portray her, and it kind of shows considering how spot-on the performance is. Ellen is portrayed as somewhat of a diva, but ultimately, she does care about the work and being a great actress first and foremost. At times, she has a hardened and jaded exterior, but deep down we see how ultimately empathetic she is. I mean, she'd have to be empathetic to love a character like Jeffrey. According to IMDb, Ellen says sorry 77 times throughout the course of the series. I guess I was too Canadian to notice how often she said it on my first watch. But this is actually an interesting fact which represents her character very well. She always feels the need to apologize for her actions, despite the fact that she wants to portray herself as confident in her choices. As the show progresses, we also see her incompetence with money, and her attempts to relive her youth by dating a hot but dumb and young man. Basically, Ellen has no control over her life, but she tries to act tough and like she has everything together. Goes to show she's a great actress both in reality and in her work. Seeing the cracks in her facade is my favorite part of her character. She's subtly deep. You really get a great sense of how much Jeffrey and Ellen love each other, and maybe even possibly need each other, despite how insane the relationship can be at times. Now we get to Richard, the festival manager. Another huge theme that this show tackles is commercialism, which is demonstrated through Richard's character. He's a bumbling bureaucrat who attempts to toe the line between the artists and the people funding the theater. Richard could be viewed as a villain, but I don't see him as such. He's not necessarily a bad person, but he's clueless in the face of being manipulated or inadvertently hurting the people around him. Throughout the show, Richard gets fucked around by his higher-ups, investors, and even the actors at times. Many of the characters can tell that Richard is really insecure and a people-pleaser, and end up using this aspect against him. Other times, they use Richard's feelings of inadequacy to make him feel like he's in control while they use him as a puppet. This really shows the real-life bureaucracy fucking around the people in the arts and how tumultuous that relationship can be. Because of this, Slings and Arrows really feels like an artist's show. However, I have to say, out of the main cast, Richard is easily the funniest character. His bumbling nature makes a great source of comedy throughout the series. I would expect no less from Mark McKinney. Although, I am kind of disappointed we don't get to see him in drag at any point in the show. Maybe he should have inserted himself a part in East Hastings the Musical. Finally, we come to the final member of the principal cast, the festival's administrator, Anna. Out of all the characters in the show, Anna is the most grounded and sensible. I feel the most sympathy for her. Unlike the other characters, she never lets her ego or pride get to her and isn't trying to be someone she's not. She's always able to keep moving forward despite the insanity that surrounds her. I sort of see her as being a motherly figure to the rest of the characters. Anna will rarely go behind anyone's back despite how unprofessional and difficult they are often being. She has an incredible amount of loyalty to everyone she works with. Susan Coyne does a great job portraying Anna as sweet and warm. She does a great job at balancing out Richard's social unawareness and bad decision making. The chemistry between Richard and Anna often makes for some of the funniest parts of the show for me. On top of the principal cast, the show features many side characters which have great presences throughout the series. I won't talk about all of them, but I'll at least touch on a few standouts. Every season has a different opening theme song and the same closing theme song titled Call the Understudy. They're performed by two of the comic relief characters in the show, Cyril and Frank whose roles are very similar to that of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. For those of you who aren't familiar with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, it's a satirical play featuring two minor characters in Hamlet observing all the events of that play from the sidelines. You know how the Lion King is based on Hamlet? 
Yeah, well, the Lion King one and a half is based off Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. I know that's off topic, but I wanted to bring it up because not a lot of people tend to talk about that piece of trivia. Another character we follow is Kate, who is played by Rachel McAdams. Kate is the representation of youth in the first season, being a fresh new actress with her original intention to impress her high school drama teacher. This is somewhat of a spoiler, but Kate along with her love interest Jack exit the show in season 2. Even though that was obviously because McAdams blew up in Hollywood, the way it's done feels very natural. People move on and do different things in their life. It does a good job at representing the theme of youth from the first season with them moving on to the next stages in their lives. It also inadvertently mirrors reality with McAdams in this stage of her life as a relatively young known actress, moving to Hollywood and becoming a huge star. Sarah Polly fills the role of McAdams with her character Sophie in season 3, representing a young actress attempting to be taken seriously. By far the funniest side character in this show, or possibly any other show for that matter, is Darren Nichols, a pretentious and moronic theater director. Played by Don McKellar, I have to believe that Darren Nichols must be based on the absolute worst directors that the showrunners encountered while working in the theater. For example, at one point, Darren Nichols attempts to modernize Romeo and Juliet by saying there's no value in presenting themes which could be perceived as misogynistic by modern sensibilities. In retrospect, this is ironically a good commentary both on cancel culture and the preservation of art. Darren Nichols represents the type of theater which is flashy and superfluous. He seems like the type of person who would have directed Nomeo and Juliet, or some other property which completely misses the point of Shakespeare's vision. The scenes of Darren Nichols bastardizing both Shakespeare's text and the musical writer's script in season 3 is a great example of how a writer's words could be lost through the creative process. But out of all the secondary characters in Slings and Arrows, by far the most interesting is Charles Kingman who appears in season 3. Charles is a drug-addicted and senile actor with one last wish before he dies, to play King Lear one more time. It's nice to see the show really focuses on the darker aspects of the life of actors. William Hutt really hits it out of the park with this performance. Interestingly, Hutt's performance as Charles is somewhat autobiographical. In reality, William Hutt played Lear for many years at the Stratford Theatre, which is likely why he was considered for the role. But more interestingly than that, Hutt actually did tell Paul Gross that he was dying during filming and to not tell anyone, which is the exact same request that Charles made to Jeffrey in the show. If it's true that the writers for the show were unaware of Hutt's condition, then it's very eerie how it mirrors the show in reality. Sure enough, Hutt did pass away in 2007, one year after the airing of the final season of Slings and Arrows. It makes me wonder if his last request really was to play King Lear one more time, even indirectly through Slings and Arrows. Either way, he gave one hell of a performance here which deserves to be remembered. This show is so well written that it actually kind of pisses me off. As somebody who's taken creative writing courses, I got some serious writer envy watching this. If I ever create something even half as good as this show, I would consider that a monumental achievement. With that said, this show very much feels like a collaborative effort which no single person could pull off. I think that your appreciation for this show will increase if you're Canadian and you're familiar with people in the theatre, but even without that personal context, there's a lot here to appreciate. Interestingly, I found out recently that there is a Brazilian remake of this show called Sound and Fury, which was released in 2009. The few clips I've seen on YouTube make it seem like the remake is pretty much shot for shot, with the same music cues and everything. Slings and Arrows is currently streaming on Acorn TV. Acorn TV also released this DVD set of the show, which I highly recommend. In 2020, many of the cast had a reunion panel hosted by ATX TV, a partner of Acorn TV. This consisted of the creators Mark McKinney, Susan Coyne, and Bob Martin, as well as Paul Gross, Martha Burns, and Luke Kirby. Coyne and McKinney discussed in several interviews about the possibility of a prequel called Amateurs, about the conception of New Burbage Festival in the 1950s. I personally would love to see that happen, and observe the same team coming back to tackle stories about new characters in a similar atmosphere. As it stands right now, Slings and Arrows is one of Canada's greatest televised achievements, much like the kids in the hall, and despite reaching a very niche audience, I hope it's remembered as such for years to come.